I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program, It Takes a Community, Preventing Child Abuse and Neglect. On behalf of everyone here, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the land of the Wango people. The Wango people are part of the wider Aboriginal nation known as Eora. We acknowledge the elders and the descendants of the Wango people. We're coming to you across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. In the past 10 years, the number of substantiated cases of child abuse and neglect of children in this country has more than doubled in its overwhelming child protection services. Tonight's program focuses on prevention, on taking opportunities to support families before child abuse or neglect occurs. We'll be talking about intervening early before damage has been done. Tonight's panellists all agree on the importance of stronger communities to the functioning of families and therefore reducing the incidence of abuse and neglect. We're also happy tonight to introduce a new way of asking questions or making a comment. It's via instant email. The email address is questions at rhef.com.au. Let's meet our expert, our expert panel. Dorothy Scott is the Foundation Director of the Australian Centre for Child Protection at the University of South Australia. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank you, Norman. Adam Thomason is an expert in the field of child abuse and has long history in research and policy development. He's Acting Director of Family and Children's Services for the Northern Territory. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Norman. Judy Atkinson is Chair of the College of Indigenous Australian Peoples at Southern Cross University in Northern New South Wales. She also identifies as a Yemen Bungjalang woman who also has Anglo-Celtic and German heritage. She has, Judy's worked with Indigenous communities across Australia in the area of violence and trauma. Welcome, Judy. Hi. Jodie Bernstein is the Senior Manager of Bernardo's Australia's Orana Far West Centre, overseeing a range of programmes in Central and Far Western New South Wales. Welcome, Jodie. Thank you, Norman. And Liz Cunningham is a GP working in private practice in Berry and at Crossroads Youth Health in Nara, both in New South Wales. Liz is actively involved in encouraging and assisting young parents in their challenging task of parenting. You'll be hearing more about that later. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. And welcome to you all. Dorothy, you better set the scene for us because it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture and we've got a serious problem. <coughs> if we look at the number of children who are actually brought into state care, these are the number of children for whom a court has deemed it unsafe for them to remain at home. We see a doubling in the number of children at any one time, on any one night, over the last decade. That's a very serious figure. Is that a reporting number? No, these are, these are children in the care of the state. But I mean, is it a phenomenon of reporting or is it a phenomenon that, that there are truly a true rise? It, it, it's both. <laughs> um, if we look at the number of reports, we can see that there's been a doubling of those in just four years. A very high level of notifications to our statutory child protection services across Australia. If we look a little more closely at that, we then see that this is a system completely under siege. In some states we now have one in five children before the age of 18 being the subject of a child protection notification. One in five? One in five. Now 20% of those will be substantiated as cases of child abuse and neglect. So we are seeing an increase in reporting, we're seeing an increase in substantiation. And if we look at what's happening in the wider community, particularly around parental alcohol and drug abuse, we'll see that we actually have got a seriously increasing problem, that we've got 13.2% of Australian children, or approximately 450,000, living in a household with at least one adult who's binge drinking. Now, not all of those children will be abused or neglected, but the dice is weighted in that direction. And then if we look at the children who are actually in the child protection system, say being investigated, we're talking about 50% of those involving parental alcohol abuse. Then if we look at children who are actually in state care, it's up to two thirds of those will have a parent with an alcohol and or drug dependence. So it's not just an artefact of more reporting. The problem is more serious. And but there's also an implication there is that not everybody who is reported is truly child abuse. In other words, there's, That's right. there's an element of unnecessary reporting because of being risk averse or what have you. Maybe yes, not. yes, there's an element of that. Not all children who are being abused and neglect, neglected are being reported, so and not all children who are being out. reported are being abused and neglected. No, no, but it's probably worth adding though that of those um, reports that uh, aren't substantiated or unaccepted for investigation, a good proportion of those families still need assistance. They might not be abusive or neglectful at this point, but they need assistance mm -hmm. to help them with um, the daily life struggles, if you like, or parenting skills, things like that. And in Aboriginal communities, Judy, the problem is acute because of poverty and... 
And more than that, there's, there's transgenerational trauma as well. And the reporting is higher, the substantiated cases are higher, much higher, but uh, whole communities can be in crisis. And that's the case with Columbaroo that we're looking at tonight, 21 arrests on child sexual assault. But that's only the tip of the iceberg in all of the other issues that are part of that mm. community's pain. So Dorothy, there are long-term effects of this? Very serious long-term effects. Uh, some of the best data we have on that comes from the US, where it was examined children living in adversity in childhood, which could be child abuse and neglect, um, incarceration of the father, ma maternal mental illness, whole range of risk factors. Long-term increased risk, both physical and mental health problems, and of course, an increased risk of being unable to effectively parent their own children. Mm -hmm. So it isn't automatic that there's an intergenerational process occurring here, but the risk of an intergenerational transmission of a pattern of child abuse and neglect in families is higher. Mm -hmm. So Jodie, is there evidence that you can deload the system? In other words, every, every jurisdiction in Australia, this is front page headlines when docs or the equivalent of docs fails you know, in the case of a care of one child, which is not surprising when you have this mm. huge volume of stuff. Can you truly unload the system though through prevention? I think if you work an, at an early intervention and preventative level, you can prevent some of those cases escalating. Uh, particularly if you're focusing on things like early childhood education and following through to education at school. But some people, Adam, Adam, might look at this and say, look, it's all just hopeless. You're talking, you, you know, when you hear Dorothy presenting or Judy presenting, talking about the statistics, um, you say, well, this is you know, transgenerational, it's cultural, it's the history of <coughs> Aboriginal people in this country, it's socioeconomic, what's the poor GP, social worker, whoever yeah. else going to do here? Look, certainly from my perspective, running a statutory child protection system in the Northern Territory at the moment, um, I think it's well recognised that without the support of, if you like, a prevention infrastructure around a statutory child protection service, what we're doing is, is not allowing the circumstances to actually prevent, as Judy has said, uh, children and their families coming to the notice of the, um, the child protection um, services and all requiring some sort of statutory intervention. I think the GP has quite a strong role, as do other professions, in, if you like, the universal level and also in targeting certain, if you like, um, groups in the community where, who may be at more risk or are struggling. Uh, and trying to do some early work to try and prevent those, those, those struggles, if you like, or those problems from um, uh, getting worse. Liz? Yes, I agree. I think that GPs are seeing children, they're seeing the parents of children every day. And if we're mindful of prevention, then we do have a role that we can play. Judy? I think it's uh, deeper than that because in communities I'm working in there's no GP, mm. there's no health service, there's no early childhood program. But in every community I've been in there are people who want to make a difference. There's skills, there's creativity, there's commitment and it's going in and finding them and, and bringing that out and working with it. But is this soft and fuzzy or no. are there reliable, reproducible ways of intervening which we know will make a difference? Dorothy? There's still a long way to go in our research base, but we do have now a growing body of knowledge which tells us that some interventions are effective. We know that antenatal engagement of vulnerable mothers and following up with a sustained nurse home visiting program for two years after the birth of the child can actually have a whole range of gains, not just a reduced risk of child abuse and neglect. We know that very high quality early childhood education and care, which has a strong outreach component to the parents, can be a very effective intervention for children at risk of neglect. We, there are a number of community level interventions too that actually have been shown to be effective. Judy? When, there's a, when we start to talk about an issue publicly and then we start to get people at a community level speaking out and saying we want change and demanding that government deliver the services that the government legally has to deliver then we're seeing change happen and when mothers and young dads also demand that they get early childhood programs they get maternal and child health which they not, do not have in their committees then we're seeing change happen. 
Have we covered off on the risk factors? You talked about parental substance abuse. What other risk factors are we talking about here? Well, what's interesting is that child abuse and neglect goes along with a whole range of other problems, which is really why prevention is so cost effective. So low birth weight, um, child behaviour problems, low literacy, uh, non-completion of school, juvenile crime, drug use, teenage pregnancy, they travel together. And so if we understand that they have a common set of risk factors, then our prevention strategies can actually be at those underlying risk factors. The underlying risk factors would be poor parent-child attachment. That's a very critical one. Low peer group connectedness. Diminished social support and social isolation. And of course, poverty. Adam, to what extent can the community be the remediating factor here? Look, I certainly take the view that a child protection is everybody's business for a whole range of reasons. And there is some good evidence, though, that um, just impacting on social connectedness or reducing social isolation in communities can have quite a strong impact on the amount of uh, child abuse and neglect that gets reported and that is then substantiated. Um, that Sony Vincent and some others did some studies uh, looking at different neighbourhoods and matching them on certain characteristics, including uh, levels of uh, child abuse and neglect. And what he found was um, that communities uh, that were higher in child abuse and neglect actually had lower social connectedness. In other words, people were more isolated and, and less connected to their wider community. Now, you can actually do quite a lot of work around addressing that. For example, uh, the National Association for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect, NAPCAN, which I'm a board director of, they've done a lot of work around creating child-friendly communities precisely to try and address, if you like, uh, how children are perceived in communities and how children and families can actually interact more in their local environments. To and does that make a, a difference when it works? Yeah, and a friend of mine's got what, he, what she calls the balloon theory, and they can start very small but can actually can expand over time. You can start with literally a family fun day with balloons and move to creating parenting resources and creating child-friendly spaces that actually can reduce isolation and allow access by um, professionals to provide supports to people. They can start to engage, if you like, and that can reduce a whole range of issues, including child abuse and neglect. Do you agree, Jordi? One of the key factors of those sorts of events is the engagement of yep. families and the focus of a community on child-friendly spaces. By engaging families, you then draw them in or hook them in to other, other programs such as antenatal classes or parenting programs. Mm. Or for young children into uh, maybe a social skills program mm. where they're learning better communication skills. So Liz, you've been trying to do this in general practice because one of the interventions you can presumably can do in general practice is <coughs> on positive parenting. I th uh, certainly you can deal with positive parenting, but I think GPs have a greater role as well. And I think listening to the overall discussion of the incidence of child abuse, it's easy to feel really overwhelmed and to think, you know, what can you do as an individual? But if you listen to what Dorothy was talking about, about risk factors, then they are things that GPs in their everyday consultation can make a contribution towards. So if you think about treating depression, so that each time you look out for postnatal depression, treat depression in mothers and in fathers. If you look at dealing with prevention and treatment of substance abuse, those things will contribute. Uh, Dorothy was talking about the spacing of children and teenage pregnancy. So thinking about contraception in those areas is something that will be making a contribution indirectly. So it's a, no, Dorothy, it's a multifaceted approach. Those are the principles Absolutely. of prevention. Absolutely. And particularly strengthening parent-child attachment, mm -hmm. the role of midwives, maternal and child health nurses and GPs, and obstetricians. It's a fascinating one, I think. I'm pleased that Dorothy mentioned that because um, that's one thing that has changed in my practice, that I came across some research that was saying that if an um, ultrasonographer doing an antenatal ultrasound spends an extra five or ten minutes showing the mother and the father the baby in more detail and connecting to the baby and beginning attachment, that that correlates with reduced smoking and reduced substance abuse in pregnancy. And so hearing that, that has made me change the way that I'll deal with um, promoting attachment of the mother to the fetus in my ordinary consultation. You're, so, you're nodding your head there, Judy. We showed some of my students, some young Aboriginal men and women, a, uh, the, an ultrasound of a baby in utero and there was a, a scenario of the father coming in and yelling and the baby jumped and then the, uh, the mother yelled back and the baby jumped again. And the young boys went back and told the young girls, they're, 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 they're the mothers of their 
babies that they had to behave themselves and then they also said that we had to stop drinking and they had to stop smoking because they had to look after the baby so there was a consciousness in the young dads and it then moved on to the young mums and that became a, I had people walking into my office saying can I take this out and show it in my community a changeable moment or whatever it is yeah. they, they call it and Liz there's the strong just going back to the parenting the strong evidence here comes out of the University of Queensland the, the triple pre program just want to take us through some of the principles behind that positive parenting yes Norman so we have used triple P and, and trained GPs in our region in the triple P program um, and that does provide an evidence base it gives GPs and other service providers that have been trained in triple P a framework that they can use when they're dealing with parents in their everyday consultations um, the principles of Triple P are around um, providing a safe and interesting environment, in creating a positive learning environment, seeing parents as being able to be teachers, using assertive discipline, um, having realistic expectations and, and also the important thing of taking care of yourself as a parent. So by being trained in, in Triple P or having people in your community trained in an evidence-based parenting program and it needn't necessarily be Triple P, you've got a resource that if a GP feels that they've got the capacity to deal with that themselves in the consultation, that can happen or they can be aware of referral pathways that they can um, engage parents to increase their capacity of parenting. And that changes the way, and primarily what you're doing here is changing the way you interact with the child. So you're reinforcing the positive rather than yelling about the, about the negative. I think it's more than that too. I think that it is, it is actually looking at enhancing the whole capacity of parents to be preventing problems uh, rather than just looking at managing misbehaviour when it occurs. And it's Triple P has an element of self-sufficiency as well, which is trying to provide um, as much intervention as they need and not more. So I think it is actually quite a powerful thing that, and a lot of, um, of parents that I will see, if you give them more tools, it can actually reduce a lot of um, problems that might be occurring. And in our experience, when programs like that are run in the community, you're also creating a social network and a culture that is, is focused on, on children. Uh, so this in itself can be a protective factor. Is good health a protective factor, physical health? Indeed, it is. Um, good health is critical and that's where the GPs are so important. That was one of our questions that came in from uh, Country New South Wales. There's also another question here. Is, um, this one comes from a general practitioner in Victoria. Is there a greater instance of child abuse in blended families? There is, there is an overrepresentation of, uh, of uh, blended families in the child protection system uh, and there's a range of reasons for why that is, uh, including the special issues, if you like, of uh, creating that new family unit. Uh, it's also true to say though that how we report in the community is also influenced by who we're reporting about. And it's often harder to report a biological family member than it is a new person who's, who's joined the family or a more so a distant relative. So there might be a relative. bias in reporting. Yeah, there's elements of that too. But there are also special stresses attached to, um, to um, being a blended family that can also lead to um, um, increased need. What's the evidence? This is a question from a general practitioner in Queensland. How much benefit would there be with a greater link between rural health services and schools, Dorothy? Oh, that would be of, of enormous significance. Um, but again, we want to start with health services around the antenatal period and early childhood and then move on to schools. But schools are universal services. They are not stigmatised. And to see schools as a platform from which one can reach out to vulnerable families and children and then maximise that is one of the most important strategies in the prevention of child abuse and neglect. Schools can actually be a hub or a nucleus in the community around which people gather. We've got a long way to go in fulfilling that potential. Judy? Absolutely, and in Aboriginal communities there often aren't the other health programs that there should be, but there's always a school there and the school becomes the place where people will go and if we can encourage the mums to come down where the kids are and maybe the dads and the grandparents are always there wanting to talk about cultural issues then you've got the potential to do some very very important work and that's what I'm saying all the time to government at the moment. Did you want to yeah, some of the best research we've got, and Dorothy talked about this before, like Aboriginal Head Start and um, Head Start more broadly and Perry Preschool type programs, they're all school-based programs that worked because they could engage with um, uh, at-risk people, if you like, or families, um, parents and also the young children in a, in a non-stigmatising way. Mm. And there have been Australian versions of those too, and also um, if you like schools as community centres, the whole idea of yeah. using that centre as a way of getting in and that engagement that Judy was talking about, we've all been talking about, it's important. 
Now, in tonight's programme, we're actually going to take a look at some case studies, and some of these are actually focused on what you yourself can do as a primary healthcare practitioner, uh, whether you be a general practitioner or another part of the primary healthcare team in rural Australia. Um, and we're, going to, we're talking about primary prevention, secondary prevention, and indeed, to perhaps to some extent, tertiary prevention. We'll tease that out as we go. Liz, we're going to look at one of your programmes to begin with. Just set it in context. Why don't you just lead us into this case study? So we're going to be looking at um, a small part um, of our program called the Young Parents Early Intervention Program that the Shoalhaven uh, Division of General Practice has been running since 2001. Tonight we're going to look at the father's fishing component, but I would like to set it in the context of the rest of the, uh, the program. I've mentioned training triple P, uh, training GPs in triple P. That was the beginning part of the program. We also, in our community, established a network of uh, people interested in parenting, um, who were workers, who were um, in any way connected with um, looking after young parents. So we have 35 members on our network now, and this has informed a large part of our program, and it's allowed our community to know what each other are doing. Um, so we'll have early childhood teachers, we've got early childhood nurses, mental health, um, youth workers, etc. network together, and we're much better informed about what's happening. Um, we've, in the, with the support of the network, developed a parenting program for young parents, and it was through running workshops for young parents that we would come back and discuss in the network the difficulty engaging fathers. Um, and as a result of discussion, someone came up with an idea of using something different, and that's what we're going to see tonight on the program. Let's have a look. I'm Liz Cunningham and I'm a GP working in the Shoalhaven in the south coast of New South Wales. Grab your packs because you will be needing there's uh, books and sinkers and everything in the case. The fishing fathers have come about through the Shoalhaven Division of General Practice having an active youth health program that's been going for the last decade and we'd been looking at how we could engage fathers in attending parenting workshops and somebody came up with the bright idea of doing something such as fishing and I guess it came from there. What I'm going to try and do today is, is teach you guys a little bit more about fishing but with a very strong slant about how to take your kids fishing uh, make, to make sure they stay safe, to make sure they have a good time and most importantly to make sure they're going to want to do it again. I was approached by um, Southern Area Division of General Practice and asked if I'd be willing to, to come and lend my expertise on the fishing front. They'd never had any problem getting mothers to come along to parenting groups, but whenever they advertised them for fathers, they got very, very poor attendance and they decided that they needed a hook and the obvious hook was fishing. I mean, most guys like to go fishing and because I've got a bit of a profile in the fishing game, a lot of them wanted to come along and learn about it from me. And we ended up, uh, we were knocking people back the first time and this is the third one. I think it's a model that could be used in other areas as well. Do people find it difficult to work out how much risk to allow their kids to take? My child has no fear. She'd just go headlong straight into that water without even thinking about it. There's certainly a perception that, that men have difficulties talking about uh, emotional issues and, and uh, those softer sort of issues like parenting, but they're probably either just a little embarrassed or not motivated enough to go to something that's just advertised as a parenting workshop, but the fishing gives them an excuse to go there. And I'm sure you could do the same thing with sailing or bushwalking or four-wheel driving or whatever worked in your particular area and get the fathers in that way and then talk to them about parenting. I just thought it would be really a, a good skillful thing to go and meet other men, um, whether they be single or, or just parents, um, and just um, meet other people, talk about the kids, learn, learn some positive parenting skills, um, which I certainly did learn. A lot of women have got their own outlets, but majority of the time men like myself, I mean we work full time, it's very hard to get out and um, talk to other um, other, other men going through similar type circumstances with their children. I mean, yes, you go to the pub, but you don't talk about the kids. But it, it's, uh, no, it's been a roller coaster ride with the kids. Oh, it must have been a yeah. huge roller coaster. Since we moved here from Tasmania, uh, my wife contracted cancer and um, she'd been through a rough period with that and she only recently passed away about six weeks ago. And I'm left now with three young kids and 
um, been the main breadwinner all my life and now I'm thrust into the single parent role with, you know, having to learn all these, what's the right thing to do for children, what's the wrong thing. How do we set limits and how do we make those limits effective? You kind of just know, I think, what's the right thing to do. You know, whether you <coughs> growl them, whether you smack them on the bum or whether you lock them in their bedroom. I mean, I don't agree with any of these things, but... My 12-year-old, I think I smacked her three times. That was when she was probably between sort of two and four. But with my two-year-old now, it's, my voice just doesn't work. I think that we're really well placed as GPs to be doing this type of work because people see us as a credible source of information and I learn a lot about what fathers think of fathering from doing a workshop that makes you respond differently in your consultation as well. Oh, there's us on the dairy farm. Part of that came out of the workshop was that yes, what I could be doing that's going to make me a better dad. Instead of raising your voice all the time to the children, talking to them. Show me your eye. Nothing's in there. All clear. Probably a bit of salt water. Trying to think about when you were a child yourself. The idea of prevention underpins a lot of the whole basis of our program, that every parent has the intention of being the best parent that they can. But some parents don't have the training, the education, the assistance, the, the background to be able to fulfil their potential as a parent. And so you would hope that if you improve people's capacity to parent that that will result in a reduction in the problems that you might see, such as child abuse. Nice program. Thank you. Liz, I'd be really interested to know how that program changed some of your practices in the consultation room. I, I guess it made me more aware of fathers and more aware of their role and the need to be including them because we all often sideline fathers inadvertently and so I've found that I've made a better effort to include fathers so if I'm um, sending information home I'll make sure I send it home to the mother and the fathers. So I'll suggest to the mother that the father reads the immunisation sheet that I might be giving them. If you're phoning someone at home and the, mum, the, the father answers the phone you might talk to them not just asking for um, comments from the mum. It's, it so made me more aware, I think. Not everybody watching has got a, a river running by. What are, the, what are the key messages that you, the takeaways from this particular, and, and I emphasise one small element of the whole program that you're involved with? I think the biggest thing is about engagement. This pro what this program says is that you can engage fathers if you get creative about it and that they want to, um, they do want to be involved. Um, so they're not just coming for the fishing? No, and that was the thing when we did when we started this. I thought they would be coming for the fishing. To be honest with you, I thought the fa the parenting would be something they wouldn't be interested in. But when we did an exercise at the beginning, and we asked all the dads to interview each other about what they wanted to get out of the workshop, and nobody mentioned fishing. Stylo was a bit disappointed. He was, <laughs> and um, we they all star. said they all said parenting, but. In terms of a take-home message from this, I think that it would be easy for something like this to be reproduced with something different from fishing that might be relevant to the community where someone else might live. But I do think it has to be part of a network, networked community program. I think if you just went out and thought, I'll do four-wheel driving and, and parenting, unless you, you actually had the support of other, other people in the community working with the group that you want to target, you might have trouble making it happen. Judy? Yeah, look, I think it's about cultural safety for all people. And if you have a man um, involved in something where he feels comfortable, he's more likely to be able to talk about and be open to a change in, in thinking about how he... And also feeling safe in the sense that, hey, look, you know, I'm not a good dad all the time. I'm not a good person all the time. I'm not a good mum all the time. I'm not a good person all the time. But I can learn more. And I think that, for me, it's been in bringing up my own kids too. And in that film clip you saw how relaxed the men were mm. and how easy it was for them to then talk about their parenting issues. There must be a transition here from what is clearly primary prevention, you're trying to prevent parenting problems and, you know, and, and heal things or you know, sort things out before they start. But you must also get to a situation, also in Aboriginal communities, where things may be more at the edge, where it's got to be therapeutic. I mean, I think that's, again, this is a very brief intervention that, that you've seen, and I think it could be strengthened and extended. But I think once you've got people engaged, 
you've then got something that you can be working with and and certainly the um, uh, times in the workshops where you may come across things that you would feel needed to be addressed in more detail and we have made referrals and um, from people who've attended the workshops and we've had people referred into our workshop from other organisations where they think that they would benefit from, from fathers being engaged. Because Jodie there's a kind of a discipline if it's therapeutic there's a discipline here where it's not just soft or fuzzy or you know just let's do things like this and engage and get men telling their narratives and so on you've actually got to do an assessment and then you've got a plan and then you've got to work things through and make sure people follow a pathway Where's the line here? Well, I think what uh, you heard Liz referring to is the skills in picking up that there might be something else going on where you might need to then follow through with a one-on-one -on -one assessment. So in a and sense, for there, this you would refer to a specialist. So unless it's a frankly therapeutic approach, it's the engagement of the clinician, whether that be a nurse, a physiotherapist or a social worker, it's their engagement that's part of that assessment process. That's right. No, we don't have that luxury. In Aboriginal communities, we don't have that luxury. But what we do have, for example, Greg Telford on the uh, Northern Rivers area has uh, weak fathers and sons fishing camps. And they do a lot of therapeutic work and sometimes they do refer on. In Columbaroo, we certainly didn't have the luxury. And when we went fishing when I was up there and I heard a lot of stories well beyond the warm and fuzzy, uh, some very, very painful stories. But it was about giving people the skills within communities to do something for themselves because we do not have the luxury of having clinicians on the ground. And that would be the tr true in many rural parts of Australia. The other issue is that often referrals don't work. And it's often through the relationship-based practice with, with the competent generalist, be that uh, a public health nurse, a GP, another health professional. It's the relationship which is based on trust and I think we need to really rethink whether when we identify a more complex problem the solution always is referral. It may be that the clinician needs to be part of a very strong network of services with expert secondary consultation and enables them to stay on working in ways that I don't think sometimes the specialist clinician is actually able to engage with some of the vulnerable young people and families that we've been talking about. And, and picking up on what Judy and also what Dorothy are saying, that's a reality in a lot of remote areas. You may only have um, a health nurse or a, or a GP if you're lucky or um, a primary school teacher and that person's on the ground and there might be 800 kilometres to the nearest mm. sort of uh, secondary service or you know, family support service or um, larger clinic. So some, that person's got to try and do what they can and we've got to try and back that up by providing you know, like fly-in, fly-out support and also training and, and other supports that we can to that person. And Norman, a referral can be, for example, an email to me, phone call to me from a, a, a doctor in the Territory or an, um, a nurse in a community saying, I've got this problem, don't know what to do, can you help me? And so we sit there and talk something through. Now, there's no specialist specialisation in that, but we're responding to a crisis at the time. And let me just say that there are many doctors out there on the ground in, in remote communities, in Aboriginal communities in particular, who feel quite despairing because they don't have the answers either. Yes. We have to respond to that. Which is really why I was asking that first question, Liz. Just the, the final point I want to make too is that I think that it is important that you do something that has some evidence base when you're doing a small program because it's very hard to evaluate an individual program and say, you know, is this effective? But if you do use something, and in our case we use Triple P, which has good sound evidence behind it, has been tested over bigger populations, and I'm sure there are other things that are evidence based, which prevents it being just a warm, fuzzy thing as much as um, I think that, that helps direct what you're doing. Tell me about your work with young first time mothers. Well, I've had a long relationship with the Maternal and Child Health Service in Victoria and I think it's no coincidence that Victoria has the lowest rate of children in out-of-home care in the country. One so of the, something's working something's in Victoria? Something's working. There. Now, now, there are different factors it, and it's hard to make comparisons across jurisdictions. But Victoria has taken quite a different policy direction in child protection and put a lot of emphasis on diversion and prevention. And probably the jewel in the crown of prevention is the Universal Maternal and Child Health Service in which 98% of families with an infant is enrolled. Those nurses offer first-time parent groups to all first-time parents. So and not just teenage mothers? Not just teenage mothers, no. So two-thirds of all first-time parents actually join these groups. The nurse runs them for, say, eight sessions. 
And my study actually followed them up two years later and found that 80% of those groups were still in contact informally. They had evolved into self-sustaining social networks, one of the most important protective factors yeah. for child abuse and so neglect. So it's the classic thing, by having a child you meet new people. That's right. And sometimes the fathers join and some of the nurses ran groups based on parenting in a new land for refugee families. With young mothers, they often feel a bit alienated from the normal first-time mother group. As one young mother said to me, all the other women talk about mortgages and marriages. So some nurses have been very creative in reaching out to very young mothers and giving them quite a different type of group experience. And that's what we can now see in Mildura, where a youth worker and a maternal and child health nurse have joined together, again forging a partnership between organisations to run a pretty special group. Let's have a look. I'm Robin Flett. I'm a maternal and child health nurse with um, the Mildura Rural City Council. Mildura is a country town in the northwest corner of Victoria, bordering on New South Wales. The town itself is around 60,000. In Mildura, we have the second or third, I think, highest rate of teen pregnancies in the state. That's about it. Thank you. The Young Mums program started just with maternal and child health five years ago and then this year it's being run at the youth centre as a partnership with youth services with a connections program. We found we were having a lot of young mothers. They were accessing maternal and child health services but not mothers groups. They felt intimidated to attend mothers groups with older aged women. Um, they felt that they were looked down upon, so we decided to tap into Maternal and Child Health Services and asked if we could run a joint program where I could help build upon the young people's skills and confidence. So each week Robin and I alternate. Um, one week Robin will do Maternal and Child Health stuff and I will do um, more about the young mums on my weeks. Um, dealing with their needs might be housing, counselling, drug and alcohol, or just general support on how they're going. Are so we getting a bottle? Settle, settle, settle. No, she has panic attacks, like her mother. Definitely isolation plays a big part in uh, child abuse and neglect. Um, not so much that we're rural, but there isn't a lot to do in small towns. And it's just good to meet other mums that are basically around about your age and your children get to play with other kids too. Well, I don't really see my friends very often from school, so I like to come here and talk to the girls and see what they're up to and what's new. Coming here, is a, I'm able to make some new friends and talk to people, actual people that are alive and not constantly a baby or a cat. Those mums just really do have a lot of particular needs. They just are different to deal with and work with. And I'm really talking about mums from about 14, 15 to 19 or 20. Rochelle. She's beautiful, isn't she? What happened here? A little scratch today. Yeah, I think her cousin yeah. did that. Oh, that's all right. It's helped me grow just mentally. You have to grow mentally with your child. You can still be like, I'm still very childish and I like Winnie the Pooh and my daughter has all Winnie the Pooh, but like mentally I've grown up more because you've got to be able to teach your children stuff and if you don't grow up, you can't teach them that. And that's, yeah, it's not just skills, it's yeah, emotionally and mentally and all other ways. So yeah, it's a good group. A lot of the things that we do with the young mums is related to life skills. Um, but they need to learn these life skills while their babies are growing and while they're needing the parenting skills. Don't stress over stuff that's just um, the normal run of the mill. I don't stress about the big stuff. <laughs> I feel that um, the program that we offer to the mums is actually helping to make a difference with child abuse and neglect because we're educating the mothers of what to expect. Some of the things we cover in the program are um, 
safety for children, care of your baby when they're unwell, any parenting things to do with breastfeeding or bottle feeding. We talk about times of stress and how to manage that stress so that they don't get cross with the baby. They tend to know how to deal with problems. Just last week we were talking about teething and what to expect with that and often that's a time when babies are crying a lot and mothers, if they know that it's going to happen, they seem to be able to deal with it better. We're only two hours a week that they come and see us, but they can call in any day of the week if they need assistance or they're feeling down or just want someone to chat to. That way I can get myself sorted out, do what I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. I feel if the mums are supported, then when she does get into a crisis with either her baby or herself, she at least come, was able to come to me and that happened several times when things were really hard at home for various reasons, partners and things. Stressed, we talked about um, babies, not shaking babies right from the very first time we see them. We talk about never shake a baby and tell them strategies not to do in those early days. And the group work um, certainly does not stop postnatal depression, but it helps to lessen the severity of it. So it's about making time for yourself, making time to look after your babies, and having some fun in your life. A lot of them don't have transport, given that they're young, don't have a licence, or you know, they don't have the money to buy a car. So it's a big thing with transport, or you know, majority of the young mums to and from program. You only get 400? It's a positive program because it's teaching them that they are worth it. Yes, you have got a baby, but oh well, we'll deal with it now. There is still time in life. You're only young, there's still time for you to go to school, get an education and make something of your life. Just because you've had a baby, it doesn't hold you back. So what are the takeaway messages in, within that for other people wanting to get things going? What, what do we extract from that particular program? I think there are five elements in that, Norman. One is that it uses a non-stigmatised service to reach out to adolescents women and uses then the peer norms, you know, changing things through the peer group rather than a one-to-one -one authoritarian relationship with a service provider. The second thing is that that group focuses both on the needs of the young mother and the child. So we're not splitting it between an adolescent <coughs> service and a children's service. That's so a beautiful integration of those. The third thing is how flexible it is in responding to that multiplicity of needs. It goes with the flow. Around, around housing, around um, drug and alcohol, um, transport, and perhaps also some birth control to increase the spacing before the next baby. The fourth thing is you really get a sense there that these young women trust the people facilitating that group. So there's warm, trusting, non-judgmental relationships, and that leads to the last point, the fifth, which is when there's a crisis, when things start to fall apart in these young women's lives, they can turn around to someone they trust and ask for help. And Liz, that ties in with some of the programs you've been involved with as a general it, practitioner. Yes, it's, it certainly does. And I think that it, what came across to me looking at that was kind of the connectedness, that, that these were not people who were, who were feeling in isolation anymore, and yet potentially they are vulnerable people who could easily be isolated. And I think that you can expand what happens there when you're talking about the flexible approach you can easily see you could be having GPs coming in and you know being involved so that you could expand the reach of, of um, the program. Julie tell me some of the programs you're involved with at Bernardo's. Sure. sure I work out in the central west of New South Wales it's a mixed community a lot of the towns we work in are fairly small they might be from 400 to up to 8,000 We've deliberately worked in towns that are not regional centres, so they're all within an hour of a regional, or two hours of a regional centre, but they aren't regional centres as such. Uh, what we find with some of the older children we're working with, that one of the most important protective factors is attending and remaining at school and school achievement. So we've developed a range of uh, strategies or interventions, all aimed at encouraging school attendance. So uh, after you've handcuffed them to the desk, what do you no, do after that? No, no, much more fun than that. <laughs> so for example, um, out at Warren, we had a group of girls who really were all on suspensions or at risk of suspension mm. because of behaviour, attitude, talking back, spitting, swearing, fighting, etc. And um, the school came to us asking, well, what can we do? How can we, what can we do with these girls? And uh, we 
we decided to work with the girls initially by engaging them in some circus skills. We were very fortunate to have a worker who had previously been with the Flying Fruit Fly Circus. And she did some hula hooping with them just as a bit of fun and then started working with them to build a human pyramid. And to achieve that, they literally had to learn how to work together, how to include everyone and make sure everyone participated because it wasn't going to work if they didn't all participate and build trust amongst one another. Having done that, we were then able to move on to a program that combined a bit of uh, combined art journaling and scrapbooking to develop some and explore some more themes around identity and articulating feelings about... So just as with the men in fishing, you're finding, the, the, you're trying different keys that will unlock uh, yeah, it's, it's about box. your engagement skills and building a sense of trust and that it's okay to do what we're doing. So it's that cultural safety that Judy was talking about. It was the, this is an okay environment to talk in that we saw in the fishing program. And likewise with the young mums, they felt safe and that this was an environment they could talk about their, their needs. And how important is the healthcare team in this? I mean, this, is it, if I was sit, listening, you know, sitting watching this as a general practitioner or a pharmacist or a community nurse, I might think, well, Okay, interesting well, but I don't see my role in all this. Okay, no that's fine. Amongst this group of girls there was one who had a hearing problem and the school had not been able to get to a hearing specialist but having worked with the girls and developed that sense of trust the our youth workers were then able to work with the whole family and get that young girl down to a, a hearing assessment down at two hours away. Uh, there were other problems around logistical things about transport. But up until that time, the school was aware there was a hearing problem, it was impacting on her education, but they hadn't been able to engage with the family to get to the hearing specialist. And I suppose there's, it's knowing if you're a, a GP in town that there is such a group that you can start to have a relationship with them. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say when you said that you know it might not directly relate to a GP. I'm sitting there thinking, well, if I'm in that town and I've got a kid who's a bit tricky, you look at what you can get them engaged with yeah. and, and that's really helpful if you're working on something else like managing depression or trying to engage them in contraception, if they're actually becoming more positive and um, agreeable to... So Another program we have is a breakfast program out at Narromine where the kids come to the breakfast program in the morning and the program is a combination of having something to eat, so getting a good start to the day, and doing the exercise. We've got a whole lot of gym equipment. Uh, that sets the children up for, in a much more positive frame of mind for the whole day, having fed and exercised, offloaded any of the problems that might have come up from the night before or at home if there's been a fight at home in the morning, and then they're ready to go to school. What about community strengthening, Adam? What yes, sort of we... programs you know, can you quote there that in the principles you might take away from that? Sure, I think um, and this applies I think across communities. Again, I've really liked what we've heard so far in terms of the idea of engagement and then building on that engagement over time and engaging with other professionals into a, a multifaceted approach. So as families get more comfortable and they open up and issues come up, we've got ways of engaging them. Um, I think some of the keys there are around um, the community or individuals in the community have to want to be engaged have to want to be part of something and it might be something really innocuous to start with and that we want to build on that but they've got to want that initially. So here's my question. Uh, the implicit, um, what's implicitly underlying this is that you're trying to build up resilience. Yep. Resilience in communities, resilience in individuals. Yep. Now my understanding of the resilience literature is that it's quite, it's a quite hard task. So the kids who will do better are the ones who already have a bit of resilience, that they're more open, they're more yep. sociable, the more willing to ask for help. Can you really teach resilience, Jodie? That's a tricky one, Norman. Because um, that's what you're trying to do, isn't it? I think you can build, using a strengths-based approach, you can build uh, the factors that contribute towards resilience. If I can Go. interrupt, yeah? because some of those factors are around, um, if you're in school, you're getting some of the skills, life skills as well as academic skills, to actually allow you to, to cope better in, in, in the things that life throws at you. Second point I'd make about that is that, and I've now lost that point. Um, I'll just, I'll just I'll back in. I'll jump in too. I've got one. <laughs> Your point that I, I think that if you're dealing with people who aren't very resilient, and I will find that with the young parents that we work with in our workshops, you actually have to really assist them to be able to be engaging, and then you can start to be, make so them more model resilient. Behavior. Mm. Uh, but also you have to like provide really structural things, like we'll provide transport and we will feed 
people when they come to our workshops really well and we give them good resources and if we just said just come they probably wouldn't but we recognize it's hard for them to get there but when they do get there then you can start to be building on the things that you're wanting to. So have you seen in your area in you know in Show Hill New South Wales a reduced rate of notification I don't child know. protection orders? I can't answer that mm. and and I don't know if Dorothy? Well, notifications tell us a lot more about the activity in a child protection system and the degree to which people feel obliged to report to a statutory authority. We don't have good prevalence data in this country. The um, Institute of Child Health in, in, in West Australia is working on developing some proxy measures for the prevalence of child abuse and neglect. But at the moment we're really relying on reports which are a very problematic measure. What I can say about resilience though is if we go back to the classic resilience studies of Werner and Smith, yes there are constitutional factors in the temperament of, of some children, but they found that the resilient children, that is the children exposed to a higher level of adversity but with fewer problematic outcomes in adolescence and, and adulthood, had far fewer separations in the first year of life with their primary caregiver. Their had pathway one, through life was one, different. One significant adult who was very committed to them, who may not have even been a relative, and greater spacing between births. Mm. So we shouldn't always assume that resilience is an innate quality in children. There are factors in the social environment that actually enhance resilience. I don't want to spend the rest of the program on resilience, but I, my understanding of that literature was that the significant adult wasn't that important, but it was this hiatus, that these children had some interruption of the adversity, which could be a program like this, presumably. Yes, yes indeed, yes. And, and some of the programs that we've just heard described, Jodie's for example, are actually providing mentoring-like relationships and, and the before school program, so that you're actually helping significant adults into the lives of children in a safe way. So Judy, tell me how it works in Indigenous communities. Resilience in an Indigenous community would not be looked at from outside as something that's uh, of real value, but in an Indigenous community you may have one house where one woman, a grandmother, is able to provide a safe place for kids. And the kids will congregate there and the kids feel safe there. Um, it looks chaotic at one level, and she's struggling to do things, but they feel it's this happy heroic and anti. Yeah, and, and I've just recently had a situation of a woman who's living in a remote community who's got six kids. Now she's subjected to high levels of domestic violence. We've been trying to get her out, but if she comes out, she doesn't have the network that's in her community that supports her in times of crisis. So when she comes out, she's not going to be subjected to domestic violence, but she. So, so I mean, there's, there's good there's things this thing. as well. The other thing I wanted to say is that I'm interested in moving beyond resilience into resonance. With some into? kids, resonance, the ability to empathise, to relate to another person, another child who's in pain. And sometimes we can build resilience, or kids can be resilient and end up in a prison system. And I've, I've worked with kids who, 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 who but when, when they're feeling with another child, they understand why the other child is hurting and then they can feel how they're hurting themselves. The other thing I wanted to say and what we were talking just, about... Just to explain there, for people who don't know the resilience literature, that, that notion of empathy and being able to empathise is a key feature Very of a resilient important. child or person. Yeah. But the thing that, that worked really well for us was um, my students, uh, in the middle of all of the arguments about what was happening in the Territory, decided they wanted to do something, so they ran something with NAPCAN called Stomp It, which has been amazing because it's taken off across Australia. Communities want to do Stomp It. What we did is we had one day when on campus, and we were going to run it in Sydney during APAC and then we decided not to, on campus we just focused on how we could have a whole lot of fun celebration around children. But we had GPs, we had all of the government departments, all the NGOs on campus having all these things and we had a big celebration with a whole lot of musicians, a whole lot of artists, a whole lot of activities and we had more children and their parents and their grandparents on that campus than I've ever seen. I've, I'd never seen people come onto a uni Aboriginal people on a university campus site like we had and they went away and talked about it for a long time and out of that we didn't have a lot more um, reports, but what we had is people saying, we want this service, we've not got this service here. This is in northern New South Wales, we want the government to do something. And we're seeing communities turn themselves around by now demanding, because the New South Wales government has not been on top of things, particularly after breaking the silence, which is a report on child sexual assault in New South Wales. So communities in the communities I'm working with are saying, come on, 
and the Western Australian Government has just said to us they are seeing implicit changes in a couple of communities in New South Wales that they want to have happen in Western Australia because of this work. So talk us into the next case study. I got an email from a community called Columbaroo and if I ever get a request, a crisis request for help, I just say yes straight away, I don't worry about the money, you put it on my credit card and go in. Columbaroo had had 21 Glad I'm arrests. not your bank manager. <laughs> I got a good husband. 21 arrests on child sexual assault and so I did two things which I'd always do. So this is a community in crisis? Yes. Um, and we have what we call ICET, the Indigenous Crisis Educaring Response Team. And immediately I get a call, I either get my students to go out or somebody else to go out in our multi-skilling team or I go out myself. In this case, I immediately ran the Commonwealth Government and said, I will make a commitment to this community, but I want you to commit me to two years of funding and I will go in. And so I went in. And I found a community that was incredible pain. Um, didn't, uh, it didn't have any words and any sense of positivity. And I had to work with what was negative first. So I asked them to tell me all the things that weren't good there. And they painted it for me. We, we um, went out and said... So it was almost like narrative piece. therapy. You, you, you. Well, it's a kind of a narrative approach, but yeah. It's, it's um, working from story. And working in a very organic way, I mean, I often get people to go out and find parts of the, uh, the, the nature around them to make the story that they want to tell me. And after they had started to name the pain that they were feeling and the shame they were feeling, I said, right, yeah, well, there's some really good things here. You, you tell me what's good in this community. And I sat back and watched them start to talk as they named the positive things in the community. And it was beautiful because they actually started to paint a canvas. I used art a lot and music and theatre. And they started to paint a canvas and then they just suddenly stopped and then repainted the canvas and painted the flag. And on the flag they painted all these hands and in the hands they painted the good things that were in their community. And then I knew, and then they took us fishing. Fishing? Just like this. They took us fishing and we caught fish. The young boys took us out. They took the mums and the bubs out and we did work with the bubs and the mums went fishing and we sat beside different people while they told us how they were feeling. So it was kind of organic, it was therapeutic, I call it educaring, educaring. So let's have a look. When the community first contacted me, I responded immediately. When there's a crisis and people want things to change and they ask for help, well, a successful outcome is more likely. Today we're creating a safe place around the mango trees. It's an open space where everyone can come down. The water around the circle symbolises the creating the safe place within the circle, which is really important. We're providing a very safe place for people to come in and share their stories and it allows them to talk about all their feelings, knowing that no one else is going to know about it, it doesn't go outside the circle. I'm the director of uh, the Healing Circle at Guinnaby. Circle stands for the Collaborative Indigenous Research Centre for Learning and Educare. There was a pain here confusion and shame. You see, historically, many in the community were themselves abused by Europeans they trusted. People feel safe working with us here, outside, under the mango trees. And that's where we create the healing circle. Oh. Community rebuilding is about helping people to tell their own stories and to listen to each other. I call this community healing. The best way to do this work is, is holistically, of course, and we have to include the elders. You've got the elders, which is the old grannies and the old grandfathers, and you've got the aunties, then you've got the young mums, then you've got the teenagers, then you've got the little kids. So there's about six different layers of people. We have to work with the elders first, gain their trust, you know, let them know what we're here for. Trauma recovery is a journey towards healing. And this can begin when people feel safe enough to ask the hard questions like, uh, why were the children abused? Who brings in the grog? Who's behind the supply of the drugs and the pornography? Through painting, dancing, story maps, we help people to find the courage to first describe their pain and then discover 
and this is important, their hope and their resilience. So first they tell themselves what's wrong and then they tell each other what they have to do about it. That's what we teach at Ginnaby, how to encourage people to tell their story and to, to help the community build solutions. Auntie, you want me to take that damper? <laughs> <laughs> yep. We were invited to come to this, this beautiful community to see if we could come up with a program of solutions to help get the community back on its feet and families be happier again and relationships start to work again and people to understand you know the dangers of drugs and, and alcohol, that they aren't the answer to dealing with your problems? Circle Work links communities to the university and it's supported by the government. It's educational, or as I call it, educaring. Community change starts with those who want change. If this community has the courage to do the work, we'll sit in the circle with them and we'll learn with them. It doesn't happen all at once. People come to the circle of healing when they're ready. We teach education which is appropriate to their lifestyles and at this community the education should be based around the strong culture that they have here, the fact that they live on the land, they're still well connected and it's paramount that we teach our kids the old ways so we can survive. When before war, or after the war, what they say, we were happy, children were happy, go to school, happy way, no argue, talk every day. But now we find it pretty, pretty hard, little bit like, you need to take money. <laughs> but those days, kangaroo, bullock, turtle, fish after fish. And that's why children never died, children never went sick, nothing, they were happy as a bird. As the old people, the elders, they share their stories. They're reclaiming the traditional law and that says that all children are sacred. We need to honour the courage of the elder who listened when she heard her grandchild's cry for help. She helped her community see there's something wrong and she began to do something about it. Now they're helping themselves and we have a commitment to be there with them. China and Gennaro came, well, everything is, is starting to come good now, you know, with the young ones. When we like more of that, you know. There's quite a few young people around about us, you know. They need more help. Yeah, when I came here, there was a community in crisis, um, a shattered community, um, and a community that wants to heal and go forward and get out of all those things that hurt in this place. And a part of that in particular is the men of this community where there has been different levels of support for women and children but there was hardly anything here for the men. We decided when we got here that I'd start a men's group. Once a week we get together and talk about our problems that we're having and then we work out ways of how do we address them. What about the kids running amok and we got to put up with all that? Oh. And why they do it? It's not about the activities, you know? Only one activity they have is basketball. Basketball. Every year, all year round is basketball. I was offered a job here with the Columbia Aboriginal Corporation. I supervise a small a mowing crew and that has helped me to work in every yard in the community and which in turn helped me to get to know the people in that household and what kind of problems that they were facing as family issues or, or whatever. Young Ian when I first came here 
a very friendly young man, very proud of his culture here. This one here, this is a bush apple tree. Always involved in putting together activities for the youth of his age, boys and girls. A lot of kids go mad over this, and all these things that look like a kangaroo. Miniwara, you remember about flying fox? Ian has been accepted at Southern Cross University, Lismore, and with him completing his studies, the rest of the youth in this community will see that and say, hey, I'd like to step up like Ian did. That's where the strength is going to come from, from themselves, you know. The strength that we have inside of us, we share it. We learn from our elders, it gets passed on to us, we pass it on to our young people, and the cycle goes on. Yeah, it takes a community to rear a child, but it takes a strong, healthy community to raise healthy, strong kids. If we help the parents to love and protect their kids, even in ways they've not been protected themselves, then we're building a generation of strong and happy kids. And then they'll be loving and caring parents themselves. And that's all we can ask for. The Columbaroo community. So what are the takeaways here that, broad, that could be generalised elsewhere, you think, Judy? That it does take a community, that there's no magic wand, that we have to be in it for the long haul that we actually had to engage across the community at all levels with the children, with the people at the school, the health workers, there's a couple of nurses in Columbaroo with the old people who really wanted change to happen. I've never yet been anywhere and sat with anybody who's sitting in pain who doesn't want change. And I think that's really important. And I totally believe, and what this does, is show that we, we've built a program around education. Education for early childhood, education for lifelong learning, education for healing. Well, and, and, and impressive. Thank you very much to you all. It's been a really moving and important program. What are your takeaway messages for those watching, Liz? I guess for me, and on a clinical level, would be to bear in mind the risk factors that um, Dorothy so clearly identified and keep them in the back of her mind. But rather than feeling overwhelmed by them, don't underestimate the your capacity as a GP to be assisting parents by reducing those risk factors to assist them in and their parents' capacity. picking off the pieces you can manage. But I'd also say as if you're a GP who's like me, who has the luxury of not working full time in clinical practice, and I know lots of rural GPs are so overwhelmed they don't have time for something else, but don't be afraid to team up with somebody like my fantastic program coordinator, Kim Oliver, and have a go at applying for some funding and do something in the community that's incredibly rewarding and it's completely different to the work you do in your consultation room and, and it's definitely worthwhile having a go. Yeah, there's often money around if you go looking for it. Yeah, that's right. Jordy? Uh, for me, in the rural context where we often have so very limited resources, the key message here is work collaboratively. Make the most of what we've got in the community. And so know your community resources and refer early when, when you can. Because in many sense that's not just a workaround, that's actually from what I hear, what I've heard again and again, in fact that's what you've got to do. Yeah. Even if you had all the money in the world, you actually want to build up from the community, not parachute you know, something shiny in that's new and that's alien. Right. Judy? Take from what we already know and build on it. Don't try to make something new because we already know a lot. Um, and we need to build on that and we need to work collaboratively and we need to get government to work with us. Now you're getting ridiculous, Judy. <laughs> you're practical up to that point. <laughs> No, seriously. Government? Yes, Adam? Government? I, I absolutely support the working with. <laughs> in fact, we're trying to do that at the moment in the north. Um, look, I guess my, my point would be um, finding the right hook is really important. We've heard that very clearly, I think, tonight in the programs that have been presented. <coughs> finding the right hook, getting that key relationship with, um, with individuals so that they actually feel support and they can actually ask for more, more assistance or more support. And I think um, there's actually a lot more interest out in communities than what we recognise. Yes. If we actually ask and get those right hooks, we actually get um, overwhelmed sometimes with just how much interest there is. I'm talking even very much struggling communities, you'll get that interest. And then we have to actually walk with them to create, if you like, opportunities for um, the community to take further action. But also to do that, you know, putting that system around them to actually support their work. Dorothy? I'd say developing trusting relationships with children and with families. And 
nurturing hope in communities and looking after yourself. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's program. It takes a community preventing child abuse and neglect. I've certainly got a lot out of it. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms because they help us constantly improve our service to you. And please register for CPD points by completing the attendance sheet. Our thanks to Perpetual Trustees, the Ian Potter Foundation, the Mary Potter Trust Foundation and the Milton Corporation Foundation for making this program possible. But thanks also to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. I'll see you next time.